Hello and welcome back to Maximo Bite Size, a series of videos on the functional aspects of Maximo Manage. Good afternoon and welcome to the eighth episode in the series on maintenance planning and the first of three videos where we will explore the functionality of the preventive maintenance application. I'm Andrew Jeffrey, and today we will discuss time-based preventive maintenance and inspections. Next week it will be meter-based and PM hierarchies, and the next video after that we'll, we will look at uh, PM forecasting. Please subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss out on new episodes as they are published. The preventive maintenance application is widely used by Maximo clients, but many use it just for time-based maintenance and inspections, which is today's focus. There will be a certain amount of overlap with last week's video on master PMs, the template for these preventive maintenance records. So apologies if you have heard parts of this before. I've split this video into three parts, in the first, we will look at the preventive maintenance header and discuss fixed and floating schedules. This is the minimum you need to get started with time-based PMs. In the second part, we will look at job plan sequences, seasonal dates and PM work generation, including considering time zones. In the final part, we'll look at the data that is copied to the work order from the PM and some other more advanced topics like extended dates and PM alerts. It could be one of those longer videos, so let's get started. The preventive maintenance application is used for any requirement to generate work orders on a frequency basis either time, meter, or a combination of time and meter. The application is used for the generation of preventive maintenance, PM, and inspection work orders. The work that is performed is normally defined on a job plan, but PMs can generate work orders without a job plan, and PMs need not have any frequency details, something I call an on-demand PM. We will find out about this when we discuss generating work orders. PMs exist at the site level. They are generating work orders, which are site level records. A PM has a simple set of statuses, draft, active or inactive, and PMs need to be at active state to generate work orders. A PM must reference either a location, asset, a route, or general ledger GL account. Something to charge the work order to. Without either of these, you will receive the error message BMX AA 3204E, an asset location route or general ledger account, must be associated with the PM. When you change the status of a location or asset to decommissioned or a synonym, then you will have an option change the status of all associated PMs to inactive. Changing the status of the PM to active or inactive does not make the record read-only. The PM is always editable. Notice earlier that I said a PM needed a location or asset. These two fields are mutually exclusive. Only one of them can have a value, not both. A route is often used for inspections of multiple locations and or assets. A route can be referenced on a PM with or without a location or asset, although the combination of a location with a route is common. You might also notice that while a work order can reference a configuration item, the PM does not reference a CI. This is because a configuration item can have an associated asset or associated location and so will be pulled onto the work order if the PM references a location or asset that references a configuration item. 
we saw last week that a PM record may be generated from a master PM and when this is the case the master PM field is populated. You can associate an existing PM with a master PM so that you can receive updates from the master PM. If you no longer want to receive updates from the master PM then you can either remove the reference to the master PM or set the field override updates from master PM. The latter method is preferable because if you choose to remove the reference from the master PM then you risk another record being generated from either the master PM or asset template. The lead time is the number of days prior to when the next work order will be required to start which provides time to prepare or plan the work order including time required to purchase materials or services. Think of this as at least the amount of time you expect the work order to be in a waiting for material state. WMATL is the status in, on a work order. The lead time in days field defaults to zero and can only be set if lead time active is also set. But this is the default. If the lead time active is toggled to off, then the lead time days field will be made null. You can get into the lead time days field and set a value if lead time active is not set, but you will receive an error when trying to save the record. The counter field is important and we will explain this in a while. On the frequency tab, there are two tabs towards the bottom of the screen for time-based frequency and meter-based frequency. We will discuss time-based frequency today. The field use last work order start date to calculate next due date when set creates fixed schedules. If unset, it is floating schedules. A fixed schedule is quite easy to understand. If the target start date is the 1st of January and there is a three monthly PM, then the next two target start dates will be 1st of April and 1st of July. Maximo is using the last start date of a generated work order to determine when to generate the next work order. The last start date is shown on the main tab. With a fixed schedule, it does not matter when you complete the work order. Each of the three work orders shown in the top left are completed after their target start date. Two weeks late on 14th of January, six days late on the 6th of April, and 11 days late on 11th of July. The inverted blue triangles represent the target start dates. If you use last work order start date to calculate next due date is not set, then a floating schedule is created. In the bottom left illustration, the first target start date is the 1st of January, but Maximo uses the actual finish of the work order, in this case 14th of January, to set the target start of the next work order three months later on the 14th of April i.e. the next work order is due to start the time frequency after the last work order is completed. On the main tab, the last completion date is entered when a PM is completed or closed, and this is used to set the earliest next due date when a floating schedule is used. If the next work order is completed on the 20th of April, then the next target start will be the 20th of July. 20 days later than what it would have been with a fixed schedule. As a floating schedule is waiting for you to complete on the previous work order, you cannot generate work orders into the future. That is more than the frequency ahead of time now. While there is still an open work order for the PM, you will receive an error message when attempting to generate a work order from the PM, the error is BMXAA3191E, uh, PMIC11460 is not due yet, or it does not fall within the active season. For a fixed schedule, you can generate work orders into the future. Not that this is good practice. 
In the time based frequency tab, a frequency must be entered. The frequency units will be days, weeks, months, or years. The frequency field must be a positive value, but it can also be zero. This is the default. A zero frequency PM can be used for on demand generation of work orders, which we'll, we'll review a little later. To be certain that no work order is generated, then do not enter an estimated next due date. If one exists, then a work order will be generated when the estimated next due date is today or in the past. No further work order should be generated. The target start time will normally be the time of the first shift in the day. A later time might be used for the start of an afternoon or evening shift, if this is the time you want to display on the generated work orders. We'll come back to the extended date and alert lead in days fields in the last section of this video. Before we get to generating work orders, we would normally be associating the PM with one or more job plans. The job plans provide the information required for planning the tasks and resources needed to perform the work order. A PM does not require a job plan. Work orders can be created without them. You can associate the job plan from the main tab and for a new PM, when you do this, Maximo will create a record in the job plan sequence table window with a sequence value of one. In many cases, there is just one job plan which is performed every time a work order is generated. However, Maximo supports sequencing of job plans where a different job plan may be attached to the work order depending on the nth occurrence of generating a work order. In the example shown, there are three job plans in the job plan sequence table window. Note the job plan field above this is read only and reflects the job plan, which is breaker inspection, performed where the sequence is one. When there are multiple records in the table window, the field becomes read only. This PM has a frequency of one month, and so every 12th month, the operator, the operate breaker, break op, job plan is performed and every 48th month, which is four years, the overhaul breaker break over job plan is performed. The breaker inspection in this case only takes 30 minutes. The operate breaker takes two hours and the overhaul of the breaker is given eight hours to complete. Only one work order is generated at each frequency you would not get three work orders on the 48th occurrence of generating a work order. If the job plan for the breaker inspection had multiple tasks, then the tasks of this job plan are often included in the other job plans, so that in effect you are performing an inspection and additional activities for the breaker operate and breaker overhaul jobs. On the main PM tab, there is a field called counter, which defaults to zero and increments by one every time a work order is generated from the PM. Therefore, in our example, the breaker operate job plan, break op, is selected after the counter is incremented to 11 and will be the next job plan that is associated when the 12th work order for the PM is generated. When you first set up a PM, you may have been performing work manually or in another system, and you may need to adjust the counter, which you can do using the action set PM counter. The dialog that opens can be seen in the bottom of the slide, and it shows the current counter and allows you to enter the new PM counter. You can move the new PM counter field forward or backwards. And we are in the middle of September, the ninth month, and the breaker operate job plan is to be formed in December, the 12th month. 
then the new PM counter should be set to the number of work orders that might have been generated by today, i.e. it should be set to 9 if the work orders are generated on the first day of the month. It will be incremented to 10 at the beginning of October and 11 at the beginning of November. On the other hand, if the work orders are generated on the 25th of the month, then you would set the counter to 8 because you have three more work orders to generate before you get to perform the breaker operate job plan. The setting of the PM counter does take a little getting used to. The action view sequence can help when you download the results to a spreadsheet and add a column to generate dates when the work orders are expected to be generated. It can help to check that the job plans with larger sequence numbers occur when you expect them. Below the counter field on the main PM tab is a read-only indicator of whether there is job plan sequence containing multiple job plans. If it is unset, there is either no job plans or just one. The total work units field is used with dynamic job plans, functionality which I aim to cover in the set of videos associated with work management. Also, before we get to generating the work orders, we ought to consider when they can be generated. The seasonal dates tab is quite quick to explain. The active days are the days of the week in which you are happy for a work order to be generated. In our example, it looks as if we are happy for the work to be performed on any day of the week, which would be sensible for a 24 by seven operation. If you normally only work Monday to Friday, then you should only select those days of the week and deselect Saturday and Sunday. If a work order falls due on a Saturday or a Sunday, then the target start date will occur on the following Monday, unless the field schedule early on frequency conflict is set, in which case it will be the Friday. A little further down, the PM will also allow you to set an active time, which would normally be the start time of the shift when the work order will be scheduled and assigned. In our case, it looks as if the teams may be working seven days a week with a day shift that starts at 0800. The active dates table window below this allows you to build multiple periods using the start day, start month, end day and end month fields. You can just see the column headings. The two fields start day and end day are values between 1 and 31, but Maximo does validate the day number in the chosen month. An active period is the time at which you accept a work order to be generated. If it falls outside of the period, then Maximo will generate the work order to start on the first day of the next active period. For example, some PM work cannot be performed during winter time, so you may set the active period from 1st of March through to the 30th of November, leaving the three winter months of December, January and February when the work order will not be generated during this time. A work order that does fall in these months will have a target start date of 1st of April. Finally, we come to the manual action generate work orders. To generate work orders, the PM must be in an active state and the reference location or asset must also be in an operating status or a synonym. <clears throat> you will receive an error message if the location or asset is in a not ready state and you can't add a decommissioned asset or location to a PM. Generate work orders is a simple enough dialogue with four fields. Some of the defaults are found in the organization's application and the dialogue for PM options. These are site specific settings. You do need to select the appropriate site first, something which I often forget to do. The generate work orders due today plus this number of days field is a look ahead period from today. It may be referenced as the slack time. With a default of zero, there is no look ahead and Maximo will only generate work orders where the target start date would be today. 
to have the work orders generated for next week, you would set this value to 7 for the next month, then set it to either 28 or 30. There is no setting which will allow you to say generate all the work orders due in the next calendar month because the number of days in each month fluctuates. It is quite common to see people use the value 7, 14 or a multiple of 7 depending on how frequently they generate the next set of PM work orders. The Generate Work Orders action also works from the List tab against a selected set of PMs. If you have selected many PMs and you use this action and there are a lot of work orders to generate, then it will tie up your PC unless you select Run Work Order Generation in the background. If you do opt for this, then you can be notified when the last work order is generated by providing your email address in the field Notification Email for Work Order Generation. Most often the setting for Use Frequency criteria is set and it remains that way. However, if you want to generate a work order and you receive the error message BMXAA3191E PM1010 is not due yet or it does not fall within the active season, then you can still generate the work order by deselecting Use Frequency criteria. This will always increment the counter and if it is a fixed schedule and Use Last Work Order's start date to calculate next due date, is set, it will add the frequency to the last start date to derive an estimated next due date. If it is a floating schedule, then the new work order's target start date will be the same as the last start date. I deselect the field Use Frequency Criteria frequently when I'm doing testing of PM-based work orders, where the dates don't matter. If you are using on-demand PMs with a zero frequency, then you need to deselect use frequency criteria in order to generate the work orders for the shutdown or outage or other reason for using PMs with a zero frequency. When you go to generate work orders and the PM has a forecast, then you will receive the message BMX AT0231E, a forecast exists for this PM. Generating a work order from this PM will delete the forecast. Select OK to create the work order and generate the forecast later using the cron task. As you generate PMs frequently, then if you are starting to use PM forecasts, you do need to consider implementing both the PM work order generation and PM forecast generation as background cron tasks. We will discuss PM forecasts in an upcoming video. The cron task called PM WoGen cron task will allow a schedule to be created when work order generation occurs as a background activity. There may be an active existing cron task instance called TB pump with only a parameter for a log file. This is linked to an extra set of settings in the organization's application and PM options. And in this dialog, there is a section called Standalone PM Work Order Generation Process Settings, where you can opt for automatic PM Woe generation. There are two other fields in this section, Work Order Generation Where Clause and Email Address Notification. The first field allows you to filter the PMs which you wish to consider for work order generation. In a Max Demo database, this is status equals active. You should configure this field to reduce the PM records that can be generated depending on your circumstances, to avoid Maximo from performing unnecessary work and to avoid a lot of error messages of the type BMX AA3191E, which alert you to a PM which is not due yet. The other field will, will provide you with an email when the automatic work order generation has completed. You can have multiple instances of the cron task 
which does give you a greater amount of flexibility than just using the settings in PM options. For example, a utility company may have one site with many regions and areas. You can be more granular using multiple Quantask instances, spreading the load on the Maximo system when work orders are being generated. Each area may have its work orders generated at a different time of the night. Each Crontask instance takes three parameters, a site ID or a comma separated list of site IDs, a SQL where clause, which helps to filter the PMs, and a log file directory and file name. Before we finish this section on generating work orders, we should discuss the time zone rules application, which will be found in the administration module. The purpose of this application is to allow you to perform processes that will derive a date in a different time zone to the user performing the process. There is only one process currently, it is called PM Wogen for the generation of work orders from PMs. What we want is to generate a PM based work order that will have a target start time which is in the time zone of where the work is performed. This would normally be the time zone of the asset or location. If a user from the time zone is looking at the work order, it must be a time that makes sense to them. When you generate a work order from a PM, the time element of the target start date of a work order defaults to 0, 100 hours, 12 a.m. But you can modify this by using the target start time field on the time base frequency tab. If you modify this field to 0800, then the work order's target start date will be 0800. If the profile of a user generating the work orders has a time zone of Europe, London, UTC plus zero. If the profile of the user has a time zone of Europe, Athens, UTC plus two, then the target start date will show as having a start time of 1000 hours. If you move the user back to a time zone of Europe, London, UTC plus zero, the same work order will show as having a target start date of 0800, i.e. the target start date is being displayed in the time zone of the user. If you use the associate time zone action on the PM and gave a time zone of America, New York, UTC minus five, and generated a new work order, there will be no difference in the time element of the target start date. It will still be eight o'clock. If you go to the assets application and use the associate time zone action for the asset and set the time zone to America, Chicago, which is UTC minus six, then the target start date will still show as 0800. There is currently no time zone rule. So without a time zone rule, it doesn't matter what time zone the PM or asset exists in, those time zones you have entered are not being used. If we create a time zone rule for the PM Wogen process and use a process rule of asset, which will look for the asset's time zone, then the target start date of a newly generated work order from the PM will be 1400. When I first saw this, I did wonder whether the calculations were correct. But you need to log on with someone with that time zone to see that when they look at the same work order, the time is 0800. I.e. the same time you entered on the PM record for the target start time field. The process rule field tells Maximo the order of fields to search to derive a time zone to use. For example, asset comma locations comma routes says, look first to the assets record, then the locations record, and finally to the time zone on the reference route. Dot notation can be used. The places where time zones can be entered are on the asset location, route, site, and organization, and PM except none of the 17 supplied process rules reference the PM object. Therefore, without adding a new set of rules in the PROC rule 
object, then while the PM application has an associate time zone action, what you enter here will not get used. To create new process rules, you need to use a SQL insert statement for the proc rule table. If you do have PMs which are not based on asset location or root, but GL account, then you will need to do this in order to be able to use the time zone associated with the PM. When the work order is generated, data is copied from the PM or the job plan, which is next due according to the job plan sequence. If a PM references a route with multiple route stops, then you will either get multiple child work orders, tasks or records in the multiple assets, locations and CIs table. The main PM tab has a couple of sections where data is copied to the work order we'll start with a section called work order information. It will be considered good practice to always populate the work type, work order status and priority fields. The default for the work order status is WSCH, waiting to be scheduled. It would be common to use PM as a default for the work type. These are the work types defined against the work order class. Work types are often configured to a different set of values from those you receive as standard in Maxima. And the priority is a value in range 0 to 999, where 999 is high, but better to limit this to a smaller range of 0 to 10 and provide a description to each value via a numeric domain. The priority field also exists on the job plan as do many of the fields we will discuss. The priority on the PM takes precedence over that on the priority on the job plan. However, there is an organization's PM option setting called Use Priority from Job Plans on Sequence PM that will reverse that. You don't need to have multiple job plans on the PM for the priority to be derived from the job plan. The interruptible field is used to indicate whether the work order can be interrupted once it has started, i.e. whether the next shift should continue with the work if it is unfinished by the shift that started the work order. The interruptible field is copied from the PM to the work order, even if the job plan says that it is interruptible. If the PM indicates it is inter uninterruptible, then that will be the same setting on the work order. The PM takes preference over the job plan. The field requires asset downtime will rarely be used on a PM because as soon as you enter a job plan, it will be blanked and made read only. The job plan also has fields for both requires asset downtime and requires location downtime. Both fields being copied through to the work order. The start and finish constraint offsets create a time window around the target start date on the work order. The start constraint offset is the number of hours earlier than the target start date used to create the start not earlier than date. The finish constraint offset is the number of hours later than the target finish date used to create the finish not later than date. These constraint offsets will be found on both the PM and the job plan. Maximo will use the one which creates the larger time window. There are seven fields in the responsibility section. The owner and owner group fields are mutually exclusive. Only one of the fields can have a value. Work group and lead are also mutually exclusive. The crew work group and crew can both have a value, but you should make sure that a crew belongs to the crew work group. Otherwise, you will receive an error message when you try to generate a work order. BMX AA 4191E, the value BOS OHLNW is not valid for crew, specified 
specify a valid value for crew. The other responsibility field is supervisor. It is easiest to use responsibility section on a PM and leave a responsibility section field on job plans blank when the job plans are used with PMs. The job plan responsibility fields can be used for job plans that are not used on PMs. This is because when they combine onto a work order, the validations will occur. For example, if you had owner on a PM and owner group on job plan, then both cannot exist on the work order. When the responsibility fields exist on both a PM and a job plan, the PM takes precedence. When the work group is copied to the work order, from either the PM or the job plan, the lead is derived from the group default on the associated person group. Trying to understand where the lead has been derived from is not obvious. A little further down in the resource information section, there are fields for GL account and storing. <clears throat> if GL validation is, is enabled for the organization in the chart of accounts application, validation options, and the field validate GL component combinations, then if the status on the PM is at APPR approved or later, which is highly likely, then a full GL will be required on the work order that is being generated. If it is incomplete, you will get an error message. The GL account on the work order is derived from the GL accounts on the PM asset and location in that order. The PM GL account is often a partial GL account providing only one or two of the segment values being derived. Other segment values being derived from the partial GL accounts on the asset or location. By the time the partial GL accounts have merged, all the mandatory GL segments need to have a value and the co-combination of this needs to exist in the chart of accounts table. The storeroom and storeroom site fields should be populated, especially if job plans are shared across multiple sites. If it is left empty, then it is filled by the default storeroom of a user that generates the work order. This can be set on the PM WorldGen cron task, but it is often set as the user maxadmin, and maxadmin can't have multiple default storerooms. As PM-based work orders are often generated after the state of approval, you do need to get this right so that the storeroom reservation is made on the storeroom that makes sense to the PM. It is possible to reference the storeroom from a different site to the PM, but this would be a little unusual. The extended date is used with fixed and floating scheduled PMs, but not with a zero frequency on-demand PM. It allows you to give an extension to the PM, for example, if resources are short or there are other priority work taking place, for example, a shutdown. If you set the extended date more than the frequency in front of the estimated next due date, you will receive the warning BMX AA3227 W. The extended date entered will cause at least one cycle to be skipped. This may cause a disruption with job plan sequencing. What this means is that you need to consider whether the counter should be incremented or not. And this depends on the job plan sequencing. For example, if the next job plan to perform is the normal job plan, then you might consider skipping it by incrementing the counter. If on the other hand, the next job plan is a special one with additional steps, you will probably not wish to skip it. Once you have added an extended date, you can choose whether to use the adjust next due date field. If you had a free monthly PM set up to create fixed schedule, 1st of June, 1st of April, 1st of July, and the estimated next due date is 1st of April, then if an extended date was added one month later, as of 1st of May, and a just next due date is not set, 
then the earliest next due date after generating the work order would be 1st of July, i.e. it would continue with the schedule as previously set. This can be seen in the top illustration on the left. If the adjust next due date field is set, then work orders would be generated three months after the extended date of 1st of May, i.e. the 1st of August, as seen in the bottom illustration on the left. For fixed schedule PMs, this is irrespective of when the last work order generated from the PM is completed. When you use an extended date, the dialog extend date comment opens for you to enter a reason for the extension. This used to be a part of Maximo Calibration, but as Calibration is now part of Maximo Application Suite, the dialog will now open. The estimated next due date shown in the time based frequency tab shows when the PM is next due without considering the extended date. In our example, this will be the 1st of April. The earliest next due date on the main PM tab does consider the extended date and will show 1st of May. You might notice after entering an extended date and entering the reason for the extension, that the extended date has now become read-only. This is due to a setting in the organization's application and action calibration options, work order, other organization settings. There is a field called default amount allocated to extend date in PM application, which defaults to one. This allows you to change the extended date once only. If it's a setting of two, then you could change the extension date twice before it becomes read-only. The override extend date action is an action provided by Maximo Calibration, which gives a person with access to this option the ability to override the extended date, except with fixed schedules, it is likely that you will receive the error message BMX AA9140E the extend date cannot be overwritten because a work order is generated or because the PM counter is greater than zero. The dialog only opens for a new PM or a PM where the counter has been reset back to zero. I've raised the case with IBM support as I cannot understand why it would be restricted in this way. If I get an answer after the video is published, I'll write a comment on the YouTube video. For floating schedules, the override extend date dialog does open. When the work order is generated, the extended date is blanked and the estimated next due date and the earliest next due date on the main PM tab should now align. Incidentally, if the PMs are associated with a master PM, then the extended dates can be viewed from the master PM application using the action view PM extend dates. The history of extension dates on the PM is found in the action override extend date, which currently requires the counter to be at zero. The alert lead in days field is the number of days prior to the next due date when a corrective maintenance work order a work order with a work type of CM reaches a certain status change, at which point the user will be prompted to generate the next PM work order early if they wish the PM work order to be performed at the same time as the corrective work. The sta status change is defined by a setting in the organization's application and PM options called Generate PM Alerts for assets when corrective maintenance work order status is. When the view PM alert information dialog is triggered, as seen in the bottom left of the slide, you will be shown the PMs which have the same location or asset as the CM work order. You select the PMs you wish to be performed at the same time and then press OK. You'll receive an information message like BMX AA32A08I PM1062 created work order 1397. And if you look at the plans tab of the CM work order, you'll find a new child work order, 
the one generated from the PM and referenced in the message. The date of the status change on the CM work order must be within the alert period of the PM. This is the earliest next due date minus the alert lead in days. The alert lead in days must be a value less than or equal to the frequency on the PM. The work order generated from the PM will have a target start date of today. It does not have a target start of when the PM was next due or any extension date it had. I hope you've enjoyed this video on time-based preventive maintenance. I hope you found it useful and thank you for watching. We'd like to see you back in our next episode when we will review meter-based preventive maintenance as well as PM hierarchies. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and if you enjoyed this video please give it a thumbs up. The music is called Drag Race from the group called Track Drive. Do check them out on tracktribe.com or one word. Until another time, goodbye.